Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to the ecosystem stage. My name is Amy Diora. I head up partnerships at DBT Labs and super excited to welcome today DBT Partners Starburst um, with a talk entitled, Why Rent When You Can Own? Build Your Modern Data Lakehouse with True Optionality. Um, with our speakers today, Tom and Brian. Super excited to, to have them here with us. Um, again, you know the drill by now. Um, hop into Slack. That's the place where um, conversation can happen. There'll be folks from the Starburst team there to answer your questions both during the talk and after today. The Coalesce channel, if you're looking for it, is Coalesce, Why Rent When You Can Own. So go ahead and hop in there. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and leave it to, to Tom and Brian to start the presentation. Thanks. Right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Perfect. Uh, nice to have everybody here. I'm Tom Nass, Director of Customer Solutions at Starburst. Brian. I'm Brian. I'm a Product Manager at Starburst. So we're going to go over uh, why rent, rent when can you own. So uh, we've got a couple different sections to go over here. First one's going to be what's the problems with today's architecture. Um, so what we've seen, and you've probably seen a lot of these uh, icons on the slide, uh, in the lower right you probably have some old ones in there that uh, I had to go search the internet for. Um, it seems like we're, we're doing the exact same thing again as, uh, you know, back in the day with Teradata and Tiza, we were pretty much locked into a data warehouse. <clears throat> and then we're starting to see the exact same thing happen again. Um, uh, I'm not going to mention names, but uh, we see a lot of the same processes happen as going from on-prem into the cloud uh, in, into one single vendor out there. And I think that's why we, we keep hearing uh, the, the term data lake has now migrated to a lake house, and that's what we're going to talk about here. So really is, is trying to avoid vendor lock, and that's what an open lake house is. And that's what we're going to talk about. So what a, why a data lake house? Um, you, you may or may not heard the term before. Um, so we talk about taking some of those features that you have in a data warehouse that was always lacking in a data lake and bringing those over to a data warehouse, I mean, to a data lake. And that's where the term lake house comes from. Uh, I try to list some of the different uh, features under the lake house um, icon there. But really, the big one is, is updating data. What really got the data lake folks is uh, GDPR, is not able to do um, deleting or updating uh, user information in data lake. And that was just a, a showstopper for a lot of companies. They really got halfway or all the way into a data lake and they couldn't figure out how to do that. So some of these, these table formats like Iceberg and Delta Lake that I'm going to talk about bring that type of functionality into a data lake. Also schema evolution is a, is a big one as well. So bringing a lot more of those use cases. Um, I'm still hearing this today at this conference is, is a lot of people still siloed what they think a data lake can do and then what they think a data warehouse can do. And I think that's the the, the term of, of bringing these things together um, and having all the use cases out of one place. And really diversity of data too. So I think a lot of times you think data science is for data lake or just exploratory, and then the warehouse is for all the BI reporting um, <coughs> and um, uh, for uh, ad hoc analysts uh, as well. And then also a variety of tools and engines. So that's the biggest thing with the lake house is really decoupling the storage and compute, being able to have your storage in one place and being able to work on that data with different engines, not just being stuck into one single vendor. And also high performance. I think that's the biggest thing that's changed even with the last eight, nine years. Is S3 was great when it first came out, but it was not very fast. Um, and things have changed a lot in the last eight years. We've not only got faster on the hardware side, we've got smarter on the software side and how to deal with object storage. So I think that's the biggest thing uh, that we've seen. And then on the right-hand side, you can see all the different kind of um, use cases there. Uh, BI Analytics, Reverse ETL, which is now popular as well, Ad Hoc, SQL, Data Science, and then obviously using any kind of tool. So any kind of JDBC, ODBC tool that's out there, there's thousands of them. So what does an open lake house look like? So you hear the term lake house a lot and that there's usually caveats to that. Uh, at Starburst, we like to talk about the open lake house. That is completely open, meaning your data sits in your storage account and it's gestion of many different kinds of, of data in real time and batch. And then you have your traditional layers, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, landing, curated, um, bronze, silver, gold, whatever you want to call it. We've been calling this uh, different kind of layers for, for 20 something years now. And they're really columnar formats. That's kind of like the big key to, to data lakes as far as performance. Uh, that is uh, Parquet, Orc, and Avro as well. And then really having a multi-engine approach here. So I have just Spark and, and Trino um, <clears throat> down here, but obviously there's a lot more engines out there that work on these storage formats. And really a variety of uh, end users as well. So like I talked about that a couple minutes ago, it's from BI to data science. I think that's the biggest thing is, is you're not coupled into just having data science or certain type of people get data out of your lake, and then certain people have to go get it from, from the warehouse. It's really all in one place. So a lake house offers more functionality without compromise. And so I try to go through the different features here, is we have interactive, 
Uh, interactive queries, traditionally that was not known as a data lake, so a lot of that data still went to the data warehouse, and you don't have that anymore. You really have second, seconds latency on a, a, a lake house. That's kind of those database functionality that we're bringing over to a uh, data lake. And then manipulation of data, that actually sounds um, really, really um, uh, trivial, but it was actually really, really big for uh, a, da a data lake. Being able to uh, update that data, delete that data, um, do merges, um, so you can do update, else insert, those kind of functionality that came from the database that's now on the data lake, uh, it was pretty powerful. And also petabytes of data, that's what you're not gonna have you traditionally over in a data warehouse. Um, even if you could in a cloud data warehouse, that's gonna cost you so much money to process that data. And a lot of that data isn't used very often. It's usually raw data, stage data that's in there, and it's more for exploratory use. And then indexing and caching, um, we're starting to see this more where we, we can hit almost all the use cases, but we start seeing use cases where people wanna do those one or two second uh, dashboard loads. And so those are the kind of um, functionality that we're bringing on top of the object store, so kind of caching and indexing as well. And to be able to use it, uh, the best engine, I think that's really, really important too. I have another slide that kind of shows that as well. And then optionality to switch to open source. So there are some Lighthouse vendors out there that they're not open source. And I think that's very, very important for us is we wanna add functionality and features on top of open source, but if you wanna use open source, that's great. There's no big deal. And, the idea of starving open source is that's not really something that Starburst is about, is Trino is a great open source engine. If you haven't heard about it, it used to be called Presto, created at Facebook. And I think that's the big, the big difference with Starburst is really just trying to make sure that open source project stays alive and it's community driven, but then we add a lot of value on top of that as well. And really it's innovator or dead. And I think uh, uh, there's someone that I know, CEO that, that likes to say that a lot, and it doesn't apply to software vendors. I think it also applies to companies as well. And a lot of that is really is the third line down is, is I call it data is the energy of a company. And if you can't control it and you can't get a hold of it, um, if you're locked in somewhere and you can't get to that data, I think that's uh, where a lot of companies really struggle. And then really the, the idea of being sticky is good and bad, right? So a lot of these vendors out there, they wanna be sticky, they want to bring you in and then you can't get off them. That was a tr traditional, you know, data warehouse appliance, try to get that data off there into some other, either some other appliance or some other uh, into the cloud well, was very difficult to do. And then also, you know, uh, keep it, the, uh, the KISS method still applies. You still have to worry about governance. You still have to worry about data profiling, uh, data quality, all the stuff that we did in, in the EW, you still need to apply that. And there's lots of tools out there. There's still the same methodologies that apply in a, in a lake house than applied in EDW. And also data warehouses lock you in, but slowly go out of fashion. I think that's the biggest thing that we've seen right now is what is the next big thing? So if you build an open lake house, you could just switch to the next cool thing that comes along. And so really what is our approach at Starburst is data is under, under your control in your account. I think that's the biggest thing I'm, I'm, uh, that, that's important to me as well. And then many engines, you know, I'd like to say uh, you could just use us for everything, uh, but you can't. And there's other engines out there that you may wanna use. There may be something in a year from now that comes along that's pretty cool. Um, you want to be able to use uh, any of the new technologies that are coming out. And again, no vendor lock-in, and also enhance your data lake. There's, there's lots of methodologies out there like data mesh, uh, query federation, uh, that Starburst and, and other vendors bring uh, to a lake house as well. And so really, how do you build a, a lake house? Um, so right here in the, in the middle part is really the most important part is diff the different engines that are available out there. And then you have these table formats called Apache Iceberg and Delta Lake. Uh, we're pretty big on Apache. I think that we've seen a huge uh, iceberg, I'm sorry. We've seen a big um, interest in it in the last year, and a lot of these vendors uh, have jumped on board as well. So as part of my, uh, uh, my demo, I'll quick uh, on DBT, I'll show you how exactly how that all comes together. And then really, you have just different kind of um, um, data out there, any kind of object storage, and any of the clouds are on-prem as well. And so how does it look like with us, with DBT? It's the exact same thing you're probably doing right now. You're building some kind of a land structure, consume layer, whatever you guys want to call it. The same kind of thing, you're landing the data, you're transforming it, you're adding value to it, um, and then from there you're creating some kind of aggregation role player. Um, that does not change. That's the exact same thing that you're gonna do with Starburst and to like Snowflake or any of the other uh, EDWs that are out there, except the big difference here is you're using the exact same DBT code, but it now sits on you know, S3 or, or ADLS or, or GCS. I think that's the most important thing uh, to get away from this. So operate your data lake. So um, I'll turn it over to Brian from here. Cool. Um, yeah, we'll dive in a bit more into like just how our different customers use us. Um, three main use cases, um, data lake house engine, data mesh, and data processing. So starting off with the first use case. Um, just yesterday, I was at the Starburst booth chatting with many of you guys. 
And one of the very common themes was um, people using Redshift. And you know, like, you, as the data starts scaling, you start encountering latency problems, concurrency problems. And so uh, once, <clears throat> one solution is to upgrade the engine to Snowflake, which is proven. But uh, that is insanely expensive. And as Tom mentioned earlier, um, you get vendor lock-in. And so the approach that, um, so when you actually uh, consider the like, actual use case, and this is what we showed, um, what we were chatting with uh, many of our customers about, um, is you are actually able to achieve all the use, your, your use case with Starburst, uh, because we have all the core functionality that you would care about. The core engine that we run, um, we built that at Facebook. Um, uh, it was used at Facebook scale and DoorDash, Slack, um, Zillow, Expedia, many others are all our customers. Um, and the reason they chose us is because we were able to execute like queries at this, like that, the fast latencies that they needed. Um, we have role-based security. You're able to use your choice of storage. So Starburst has the core functionality that you would care about. Over here, um, I also link a case study of Emis Health. And there, um, we interviewed uh, Richard Jarvis, uh, CTO of Emis Health. And so this is the largest healthcare provider in Europe. So imagine that they're streaming data across all the patient da um, database management systems in Europe <coughs> into a single data lake and processing that data. So they're processing petabytes of data every single day. And they evaluated lots of solutions. Like Redshift, it was too slow. Their queries all took a minute to load. With Snowflake, the bill was way higher than they were willing to pay. Um, Starburst was able to solve their problems for them. Um, a second use case, data mesh. Now, this is something that's become an overloaded term. Like, like everyone is tossing their hat into the data mesh ring, uh, claiming we can do data mesh. Um, so where this got started, um, we actually encountered this issue 10 years ago, before it was a thing. Um, back at Facebook, where Trino was created, uh, we had the Facebook feed team approach us, saying that they were not doing fraud detection, they were not doing cyberbullying detection, and we were getting the news. And the real reason why we were not doing fraud cyberbullying detection, uh, it was because the data was in a MySQL database. The feed database was a MySQL database, not the data warehouse. And so we were simply just uh, not caring about like, serious issues happening on the Facebook platform. And one of the questions you might ask is like, well, can't you just ETL that data into your data warehouse? Two big problems. Number one, uh, like, we didn't have that kind of money. Like, having multiple copies of your data, that gets insanely expensive and complicated to manage. And second, uh, like, we need to detect that kind of issue in real time. We can't go to the press and say, like, hey, sorry, we detected um, spam on our platform, cyberbullying in our platform a day late uh, because of data warehousing problems. And so uh, over the course of the past 10 years, we've implemented many optimizations to really make query federation extremely efficient. Um, so things like file indexing, caching, cost-based optimizer, dynamic filtering, join pushdowns and so much more. We've been working on this problem for 10 years. And so we just have um, much more performant uh, federated queries. Um, so in this case study um, linked to, from DoorDash, um, Akshay, who's the head of, data at DoorDash, head of data platforms at DoorDash, dives into his evaluation of the different database engines that claim that they can do query federation. And what he found was that uh, Starburst was really the only platform that had all the connectors that he needed, and the, query, the federated queries just ran 10 times faster. Um, this was like real DoorDash use cases. Starburst was the only platform that could really achieve the vision of data mesh, where data really truly is decentralized, and you can just query data where it lives, and you get the latencies that you would expect. Every other platform, you'd be waiting for 10 minutes for that data to load. Um, and the third use case. Um, so for those of you who have like, read the Trino paper, um, this was actually not an initial use case that we envisioned when we developed Trino. Um, but what we, uh, when we open sourced it and chatted with our users at Facebook, at Netflix, at LinkedIn, uh, what we discovered was really surprising. Everyone was hooking up Trino 
with Airflow and using Trino um, to do their data processing as well. And that just made a lot of sense when we chatted with them. Uh, they wanted to take advantage of Trino speeds, the really interactive experience when developing data pipelines, all the connectors we have to do query federation. Um, all these capabilities, um, they, wanted the, the, uh, they wanted these advantages uh, when they developed their data pipelines as well. Um, there's actually one more very subtle point um, that's a, a common reason why people um, chose Starburst and Trino for their data pipelines. Um, that is, uh, like, we work, of course, with DBT to, um, as the framework, and a, a lot of times, like, your data analysts, they know how to develop like Starburst queries for their interactive dashboards. But Spark, developing Spark data pipelines, that's just really hard, and so they toss that over to the data engineers. Um, a lot of times, they're just like, they don't have time to go take courses to learn Spark. And, um, and many companies, uh, da data, engineer, data analysts, they don't have access to Spark because there are like real security risks that can come from the ability to deploy arbitrary Python code in Spark. And so using Starburst uh, for uh, data pipelines just makes it accessible, data pipelines accessible to everyone. Um, and it, it's able to remove the bottleneck that you have today on data engineers. I uh, wanted to make a quick plug. We have the Trino Summit coming up on November 10th. Uh, we'll have a lot of people diving really in depth into how they uh, deploy their warehouses at scale. Um, Zillow and Lyft will also be giving talks about how they use the Starburst and Trino platform for their data pipelines as well. So if you're interested, uh, just uh, uh, we have the slides uploaded in our uh, channel. Um, just go, go ahead and register. And it'll be both um, in-person SF and streamed virtually. Um, now, diving into some of the core benchmarking, um, we did some benchmarking on TPCH dataset. Yeah, it's not perfect, but uh, it's the most widely used benchmark. We scaled it up to 10, ter data, 10 terabytes to simulate the workload that you would run. And what, uh, in, in this testing, um, and uh, you can run your own test as well, like Starburst is ex able to execute your data pipeline queries 40% faster. And that also just translates to major cost savings as well because our engine is just so much more efficient. Um, and secondly, um, one of the very common themes coming up in our customer conversations is running on queries on spots. Because spots, as you guys know, are like uh, instances that are 50% cheaper, that, but that are frequently turned over because um, like AWS can take it away at any time. Um, one of the key innovations that we did in order to make Starburst be able to run on spots really effectively is we use an external exchange spooling mechanism. And what that means is that essentially when you encounter hardware failure, uh, you don't have to retry from scratch because the checkpointing data is stored on an external buffer. And so the net result of this is in our benchmark testing, Starburst is just able to execute queries on spots extremely efficiently at scale. And um, so efficiently so that like Trino, like Starburst running on spots is actually cheaper than running EMR Spark on spots. And it's, it's actually, sorry, it's actually faster than running EMR Spark on spot instances. So that's another uh, core use case if you guys are looking to be able to deploy spots to realize the savings. Um, now I'll pass it back over to Tom to just show you guys what Galaxy is all about. Thanks, Brian. All right, now the fun part is a, a demo. So for folks that use DBT, this is pretty familiar to you. You have a land uh, structure and consume layers. Um, everybody calls it something different, like I talked about before. We're going to use um, uh, Starburst Galaxy, which is our uh, software as a service product, uh, so a managed Trino, basically, on top of um, uh, AWS in this instance. And we're going to use uh, Apache Iceberg. That's going to allow us to do merge and updates, um, partitioning, um, optimizing, a lot of cool stuff that uh, we've built into the engine uh, that Apache Iceberg offers. And then um, since ThoughtSpot was here, I thought I'd use them uh, for a BI, BI tool uh, to, to query everything. So that's actually where I'm going to start first. I'm going to start in ThoughtSpot. And I have a little dashboard that's pointing against uh, my data. And just so there's nothing up my sleeve, there's nothing there, because I love doing live demos. So um, that'll come up with something here in a minute. So the first thing I'm going to do is, um, this is Starburst Galaxy. So this is a, uh, uh, the UI in the Starburst Galaxy. From here, we have clusters and, and catalogs and then a query editor. 
and then we have clusters that you can point any kind of JDBC or ODBC tool against. Um, so catalogs here, um, I don't have, I should probably go into account admin. So I gave DBT a really, really slim amount of permissions to do the demo. So clusters, I have a bunch of different, different clusters. I can deploy in any of the different clouds, so all three clouds in any of the different regions that are out there. Right now I have AWS running. I have some clusters in here that are in auto suspend, which means I'm not paying for them, but they're still listening. So if I run a query against my Azure cluster, then it'll come out of suspend into running and then execute those queries and go back into suspend. So more of a cloud pattern. And then I have my catalogs. So catalogs are the, my connections to the different data sources that are out there. So in this demo, I'm just gonna concentrate on S3, which is uh, probably a primary uh, data source for uh, a lot of the DBT folks, or any of the other three cloud um, uh, storage providers. And then we have other um, connectors in here as well to do federation, joins between different kind of uh, connectors, and then we have more coming that'll be added to Galaxy soon. So under my query editor here, uh, first thing I did was create a bunch of tables for my landing area. Uh, so I just made some tables up. We have a connector called TPCH. So I just created a bunch of JSON files uh, out there, a bunch of JSON tables uh, based upon the TPCH data. So I'm not gonna rerun these again, but those are already sitting out there ready to go. So let me go back into my DBT role where I have it nice and slim down here. And so I have uh, different schemas in this S3 connector that I have. So I have my land, structure, and consume. So under land is those tables I showed you on the right-hand side. We won't worry about those right now, but those are gonna be our source. So I have nothing in structure and nothing in consume right now. So if I go into DBT, in my Visual Studio, hopefully you guys can, can read this all. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show was my connection. So my connection to, to Galaxy is very, very easy. It just uses the, the Trino adapter, username, password, whatever role I wanna go in, which is DBT, and then uh, uh, what database I want to use, what connector that I want to use. But obviously I can issue queries that go across different connectors if I, uh, if I want to. So here's my different um, uh, uh, modules here. I have my structure and my consume here. So here's all the SQL that I have. I'm gonna go ahead and start running this. I'm gonna run the, the whole thing, just so it's, uh, uh, so we can just go through it all. So dbt run. So that's gonna start going through all the different kind of um, structures here. So, uh, let me show you a couple things here. So under DBT project, I have uh, all my models. One thing I'm doing a little bit different here, I have a customer, uh, my customer table. I'm actually going to be doing some incremental. So I'm using Iceberg here, um, and I'm going to do uh, a merge, and then I'm only going to update these columns here under my table. So I can continue to run that. So as data is landing in my landing stage, my landing table, um, I want to make sure that I'm not pulling in duplicate data in. So I can either truncate that landing table every time I add, but if I'm constantly adding there, then I'm gonna go ahead and add this incremental um, strategy. If you're a DBT, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is pretty standard to do in any of the EDWs. This is no different. The point is I can take this code outside of probably this part right here with the properties and run this against any cloud data warehouse. It'll run the exact same thing. That's the power of it and now it sits out on S3, and then I can actually point other engines to it as well. I'm not just stuck in some kind of uh, cloud data warehouse. So I'm up to eight out of 12, so I'm gonna come back into here and show you as these tables um, appear in structure. Uh, we have like, a, I think a 10 second cache in glue, so I have to wait here just a couple seconds. There's my tables now. So the tables are starting to populate in structure, and then I don't know if I'm in a consume yet or not. No, not yet. So a couple things there, so if I come, um, back into, let me show you exactly what one of these other roll-ups look like. So this is just pretty basic SQL here. I'm just uh, joining a couple different of these tables in my structure layer to create this sales roll by week. So pretty standard SQL that, um, and I use uh, variables in here as well, so I can do repeatability. And so I'm completely done here. So let me go back in here and double check my consume. And I have my table. So I've built all my tables up, I've built this little this little pipeline to build structure, consume. I'm gonna come back into ThoughtSpot, go back into my live boards and click on sales again. And that's gonna query those, um, those five tables that I have there. So I can build this little dashboard here um, that I have total by order by month, sales by week, sales by year. And this is, again, this is coming directly off of S3. The fun part to do is come back into S3 and actually go into one of these. So here's my, my structure directory. And these are just tables. Um, the reason why there's uh, the table name and a UUID is because for renaming. In Iceberg, you can rename tables, so you would get yourself into trouble if you did not change, um, because in, in, in S3, you can't just rename folders. So um, I come into here, and these are just Iceberg tables. So when I say Iceberg, 
These are just, um, by default, these are, I actually have these as Parquet, and then there's a the metadata. So that's all it is. When people talk about Apache Iceberg, this is just a layer of metadata that sits on top of your table. So you could do snapshots, updates, all the really cool stuff that uh, a database would give you. But again, anybody can come query this table. It doesn't have to be Starburst. It could be Spark. It could be a bunch of other ones. It could be Athena as well. So that's what's nice about uh, uh, Iceberg is this is in here. It's in my account, which is really nice. And the last thing I wanted to show here was I was just doing some audit runs here. So I actually have a typical um, way we do, uh, you do it in, in EDW is, let me go back into here, I'll go to my project, and then I'm just doing some updates. So I'm inserted into this uh, audit, and then I'm gonna do an update. So stuff that you wouldn't normally think you could do on top of S3 is now you can do this, because this is an iceberg table. And I can do updates, I can do deletes, I can um, uh, change partition information, any of that kind of stuff. So the same kind of, as I was learning DBT, I kind of see what the best practices are out there, and this is everything that I see. I'm like, I can do all this stuff in here. So that was kind of fun to do. So um, let's see here. I think that was it for the demo. Uh, any questions or anything? It's time to go up. Oh, perfect. Perfect amount of time. <laughs> Nailed it. I don't think I have anything else to go through here. Um, yeah. Oh, the questions are in the chat. So. Yeah, um, if you guys have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat and yep. uh, we'll be getting back to you there. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much.